Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with me, my name is Sarah Corley. I am DFI's Community Manager. And running our webinar series is one of the most enjoyable parts of my job. I get to meet wonderful um, guests and learn new things every time we do a webinar. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Just a couple of housekeeping things before I hand over and begin to introduce you to our guest speakers. Um, we are recording today's session, so if you do happen to have some sort of connectivity issue or you enjoyed it so much you want to share with your colleagues, you'll be sent a link to the recording most likely tomorrow. Let's get it out there as soon as we can to you um, so you can catch up and share. We will also be having a Q&A throughout the session as well. So unlike some of the traditional formats of webinars, we're going to take questions throughout this webinar. So we have um, the wonderful Arisha who's joined us on the line. Hi, Arisha. Um, she's going to be uh, monitoring the Q&A and answering as many of your questions as possible. So let's challenge Arisha as much as we can and ask as many questions to her in the Q&A function as we can. Um, the Q&A you'll find at the bottom part of the screen when you move your mouse down. So use the Q&A if you can rather than the chat because it's we can actually give a nice reply. Um, and what we can also do is, is download a report of those questions and answers and make sure that we circulate them should we run out of time to answer every question live. We're also going to be taking Q&A at three distinct points during the webinar as well. So um, Peter, our guest presenter, is going to be giving you three different models um, of digital banking and we're going to have a Q&A after each one to make sure that um, you can ask the relevant questions after each bit. So hopefully you'll enjoy the session. It's going to be a nice interactive one. I happened to see a sneak preview of the presentation yesterday. I was really excited. So I'm very much looking forward to kicking back and, and learning on this one, because actually I'm going to introduce you to our moderator for today's session, Elizabeth Friend. Um, Elizabeth is DFI's um, subject matter expert when it comes to um, MSME. So we're really pleased that Elizabeth joins us again for our second webinar. Um, and it also means that I get to take a seat back. So fantastic. Enjoy the session, everybody. Thank you for those who've joined us and uh, for our panelists and over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sarah. So welcome everyone. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Friend and I uh, teach a course uh, for DFI on digital MSME finance. And what I've really seen over the last couple years is a lot of change and evolution when it comes to digital financial services, especially for MSMEs. A lot of the new digital and, and technological innovations that have been happening have allowed for a lot of scale potential, reaching brand new types of MSMEs and other, other clients that were difficult uh, to serve before. Um, there is new efficiency built into a lot of the business models that we are seeing from financial service providers um, and also the opportunities for a lot more customized products and services than uh, were ever thought possible beforehand. Yet what I've also typically seen is that conversations around digital MSME finance typically center around fintech startups. And it is certainly true that there's a lot of innovation and a lot of, of change and interesting things happening from that very specific type of provider. Yet there's also been a lot going on with digital banks in recent years, but it is a topic that is a little less frequently talked about. So I'm really excited to be joined here um, by Peter and Arisha to really look into the topic of uh, digital MSME finance uh, from the perspective or, or lens of digital banks in particular. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Peter, and to uh, you, Arisha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thanks to Sarah for having us as well. I'm a big fan of DF5, taking some of the courses myself. So uh, it is a, a great privilege to be talking to you guys today. So as mentioned, I'm Peter Zetterly, and we have Arisha Salman on the chat. It's early in the morning here in DC, so please do keep her awake. Fire off her questions, your questions to her throughout the session so that she uh, she has something to do and doesn't, doesn't go back to sleep. That way we can try to keep this interactive, even though I will be speaking for much, uh, much of the session. We will be breaking, as mentioned, regularly for, for some Q&A as well. But uh, we have a fair amount of content we want to try and get through uh, today. So without further ado, uh, let's dive into it. 
Uh, we're going to talk about the new uh, business models for digital banking, what they mean for financial inclusion and, and for MSMEs. Um, and to set the stage for that, I'd like to start with the general state of inclusion uh, because it sets, sets the scene in a way that helps you understand why some of these models can be so impactful. So uh, let me just see that that's actually switching on your end. Okay, there's a little bit of a lag. Uh, this current state of inclusion is a, partly a good story. Over the last 10 years, we've made great progress. Uh, we've seen over a billion uh, individuals gain access to formal financial accounts for the first time uh, just between 2011 and 2016. Uh, that is partly thanks to mobile money, uh, which is a prime example of, of a sort of tech-enabled business model uh, innovation that has been really transformative and that CGAP has worked uh, extensively on. We now have over a billion mobile money accounts worldwide. And we have nearly $2 billion uh, transacted on mobile money every day. And overall, these stories tell, tell uh, these numbers tell the story of a real broadening of financial inclusion. Um, but, as, and as a result of that, 70% uh, of, of adults uh, had access to a basic financial account in, in 2017. We don't have the last index yet because of COVID, uh, but likely those numbers are even higher, probably in the order of 75%. But what's notable is that even as we made such great progress on accounts, uh, progress on savings, credit, and insurance products uh, has been a lot slower. In fact, it's barely risen at all, uh, which, uh, which limits the usefulness of all those accounts that we've been able to, to get out in, in the hands of people. And that means that while financial inclusion access has broadened, it has remained shallow. Uh, and that applies to MSMEs as well, uh, where the needs are still very considerable. MSMEs represent about 90% of businesses and 50% of employment worldwide. Uh, but still, the IFC estimates that there are 65 million formal MSMEs around the world uh, that are constrained by lack of access to credit, around 40% of all formal MSMEs worldwide. And to that, of course, we have to add tens of millions of informal MSMEs that also lack access to credit. Uh, the total credit gap that, that IFC puts the number on uh, is around 8 trillion US dollars uh, financing gap for the formal and the informal uh, small businesses, small, micro, small, medium-sized businesses out there. So there is a huge need still outstanding in the general population and among micro, medium, and small uh, enterprises. So as an industry, what we need to do is get beyond access to account to focus on a deeper range of product and services that are relevant, affordable, safe, and accessible to the under bank, including to the MSMEs. We think big part of this um, has to do with constraints that are inherent in the business models of the financial service providers. When it comes to the banks, uh, they tend to have a lot of uh, depth uh, on the, the product offering that they provide but they have continued to struggle to develop scale. Uh, a lot of that has to do with high operational costs, which is a key issue. Uh, distribution tends to remain a major challenge despite the innovation around agency banking. Uh, they struggle with outdated IT systems, uh, with outdated product management practices and so forth that have so far, so far uh, restrained banks in most countries from achieving the kind of scale that we need to see in order to truly close the inclusion gaps. When it comes to mobile money providers, um, they have been far more successful on developing scale, but they haven't managed to develop a deeper offering. Um, and that's for a couple of different reasons. The revenue model tends to be one of them. Uh, mobile money providers tend to be heavily oriented around uh, transaction fees on payments. And that limits both their imagination and, and what they're actually able to do in terms of a broader product offering. If you wanna offer a savings product, that's hard to do if you're charging people a cash out fee when they try to withdraw the savings, for instance. So that, that mindset and the rev and heavy emphasis on transaction fees has, has held them back. Uh, regulation, of course, is the other one. Most uh, mobile money providers in, in most markets are not allowed to offer the full range of products and services uh, and I personally expected years ago that we would see loads of them start to acquire banking licenses. But the reality is we haven't seen that. Almost none of them have. Um, and instead, they've opted for one-on-one -on -one strategic partnerships with banks, which is a good uh, second best approach, but it tends to be slow and clunky and difficult to do. And it sort of has, has held mobile money providers back. 
the thing that, that both of these types of providers have in common is uh, an increasingly outdated approach to the business and to the consumer. Uh, in our view, in my view, certainly, they tend to adopt zero-sum competitive approaches that are aimed at owning the customer, uh, where the priority is to sell your own products, right? It's not on creating value for the customer by solving their problems and meeting their needs as much. Um, but the emerging competitors in the challenger banking space tend to have a very different approach to the business and to the customer as, as we're going to see. So the bottom line on inclusion is that we've seen inclusion broaden, but it's remained shallow. Uh, and we see business model reasons as a big part of, of the reason why. But there's no reason it has to remain that way. There's nothing inherent in banking that says that it has to look the way we become accustomed to banks looking. And I couldn't resist sharing this tweet from last week from the German Challenger Bank uh, N26 that somewhat cheekily makes the point that no, you really don't need branches actually. Uh, so uh, for the next hour, let's forget everything that we think we know about uh, what banking is and what banks look like uh, because there are significant winds of change blowing uh, that are throwing a lot of that uh, out the window. Um, before diving into the models themselves, I want to say a few short words about how we think about inclusion in this context. Um, uh, we, uh, when we look at business model innovation, uh, we analyze their inclusion potential along four main dimensions. The first is simply cost. To what extent does the business model uh, make it cheaper to offer services and, and to, uh, to customers? Uh, and or make it cheaper for customers to access financial services in terms of money or time or, or anything else. Uh, the second dimension is, is access, uh, whether physical access, digital access, or uh, eligibility for product, which is increasing thanks to alternative data, innovative uh, scoring methods, and, and so forth. The third dimension uh, is fit, product fit, uh, which simply means uh, to what extent can a wide range of customers all see their needs met, their diverse needs met? Uh, that includes product diversity, it includes suitability questions, it includes personalization and customization that Elizabeth uh, mentioned. Uh, and the fourth metric is experience. Uh, how simple are the products? Does the business model make the products easier to understand, easier to use, more transparent? Do they give the client more control and greater empowerment in, in using the service? So that's how we think about it. And we'll come back to that lens throughout the, throughout the session as we look at each model. So we have identified three business models that we think are genuinely new uh, and that are potentially impactful when it comes to financial inclusion. They are the fully digital retail bank, the marketplace bank, and banking as a service. And um, before I get to the models themselves, which I will on the next slide, I want to point out that uh, while many of the examples that we've looked at and many of the examples I'll be speaking about are from the, the United States and from Europe, which is natural because a lot of the, the sort of forefront of innovation in this space is happening in those markets, uh, that does not by any means mean that we're not seeing this in, a, in developing emerging markets or that they're not relevant there. On the contrary, already last year, beginning of last year, we had 35 examples across 20 markets uh, this slide needs an update because there's a lot more that we could put put out there, uh, uh, put on there today. So just to say, because I'll be talking about European and American actors, it does not by any means uh, mean that they are not relevant and not present in emerging and developing colonies as well. They absolutely, absolutely are. So let's start with a fully digital retail bank. Um, I'm going to have the standard slide that I go through uh, for each of the models where I talk a little bit about who the bank is trying to serve, what they tend to offer, and how they go about offering that. Um, and I'll go through it in relative detail, but we can always come back to it in the Q&A if people wanna drill down on, on specific pieces. So if we start off with a fully digital retail bank, the best way to think about these banks is as having a fairly standard uh, business model for retail banking, but a very different operational model. When you look at the product set, it tends to be quite traditional. So they typically start with a transaction account, payments instrument, normally a debit card and an app-based uh, interface. And then they gradually add on savings products, credit and insurance as they go along. The target customers also tend to be pretty traditional, mass market individuals, 
Uh, there are a whole bunch that serve MSMEs specifically. Um, and there are a few that are trying to serve uh, both groups of clients as well. Uh, but from there on, uh, uh, these banks uh, do start to look somewhat different. So most notably, they tend to have very little by way of physical distribution infrastructure. Certainly, don't, they don't have any branches. Instead, uh, they rely on, on ATMs, point of sale, and most importantly, partnerships with retail players that have a big existing uh, footprint. The main channel for the customer is digital, phone, app, chat, and so forth. Secondly, they have an entirely different technology stack powering the bank. Uh, incumbents tend to have uh, systems that have been layered and layered and layered uh, over for decades with a core often dating back to the 70s or maybe the 80s, written in COBOL that no one's even been teaching for 20 years. Um, these new banks are entirely different breed. They run cloud native cores, they are API first, they're built on microservices architectures, they're modular in design and so forth. And that allows them to offer a very different value proposition to, to the client. Um, in short, the value prop tends to revolve around low pricing as one element and very competitive rates. Uh, typically they offer their accounts entirely for free, no sign up charge, no minimum balance, no, no, no monthly fees uh, and so forth. Um, they tend to offer very competitive savings rates, competitive rates on, on lending as well. Um, in addition to that, they tend to offer a very modern UI UX that's more in line with what, what consumers expect these days. And they tend to offer a greater sense of transparency and control for the user. Many of them frame themselves as more honest services that are clearer to the customer to understand, that are more in line with the customer interest, uh, and that don't have you know, gotcha fees when you overdraft and things like this. Um, the revenue model accordingly also tends to look a little different. Often these banks have a freemium model um, that where the core product set is offered entirely for free. Uh, and then you can add on various premium layers to it depending on, on what you need. Uh, many of them are doing subscription models. So you pay a flat fee every month like you would for Netflix or Spotify. Um, and sometimes they have multiple tiers so you can subscribe to different bundles depending on what it is that you want out of, out of the service. Um, in addition to that, they also have some traditional revenue models. Payments interchange tends to be very important for these banks. Um, and as they move into lending, net interest margin also, also becomes uh, more important. The underlying business logic um, typically looks something like this. So build an operational model that has very low cost and is highly scalable. And you do that by having very limited infrastructure, physical infrastructure, by deploying cloud native solutions and by automating everything that you can. And with these tech stacks, that, that turns out to be quite a lot. Um, then you offer your account and your core services for free to drive uptake, which gets you transactional data that you then use to develop and, and tailor and target uh, the premium products that you wanna start making money off of. And then you, you drive towards a, a low margin, high scale, high volume business. Um, there are a number of dependencies around who can do this. I'll, I'll skip over it in the interest of time. We can come back to it if, if people want to. Um, but just to say that um, there are a number of examples of these banks out there. These are just a few. And, and to give you a clearer sense of what this might look like in an emerging market context, I, I wanted to share the example of Time Bank in South Africa. So let's take a quick look at Time Bank, and then we're going to hear from the co-founder of Time Bank um, as well. So Time Bank launched in January 2019. So last year was their big public launch. They have a very sophisticated cloud-based tech stack that they built themselves. They have no branches, but they have 1,500 touch points all across South Africa in partner retail stores like Pick and Pay and Boxer that some of you may be familiar with. Um, what they also have is the Time Kiosk, which you see here on the screen, which they also designed and built themselves. They're assembling, building them in, in South Africa, manufacturing them in South Africa. They are staffed by these time ambassadors who give customers help and information. And through this kiosk, they can onboard a customer in under five minutes, including printing a personalized debit card on the spot, no paperwork required. Uh, it's all based on biometrics uh, and, and uh, national ID database and so forth. Time Bank signs up 85% of their clients through these kiosks. Um, and that is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's very cheap. 
running a kiosk like this is around 4% the cost of running a bank, bank branch. Um, the end-to-end -end customer acquisition cost is around $3, including the cost of the card, uh, which is very cost effective for them to, to acquire customers. Um, and they are very successful uh, with this model. In less than two years, they've signed up 2 million customers, still growing very, very rapidly. Um, and they are able to offer significantly better rates than the rest of the market on their savings product, on their lending product, on transaction fees. In fact, according to independent research so not time themselves, they are the cheapest bank in South Africa and by some margin. Uh, this shows the, the total cost for a common mix of 12 transactions in the South African market. And what it tells you is the time bank is far and away the cheapest bank. They are two thirds cheaper. They cost two thirds less than the typical bank in the market, and they cost 40% less than even the second cheapest bank in the market. So they are considerably cheaper for people to use than, than the other banks um, in the South African market, and that is because of the, the operational model they have set up. So Time Bank is a great example of how digital can slash cost and end user pricing as well very significantly. But the digital model is not all about cost, not by long shot. That is often what we seize upon immediately but digital has a lot more to offer. So I thought it would be useful to hear the co-founder of Time Bank talk about the role that he sees digital uh, technology playing in the reinvention of banking. I think the mistake that many players make is to fall in love with technology as a sort of a centerpiece of strategy. Um, without deeply understanding that technology is always just a means to an end. And that technology does not only mean things with, with electricity in them. Um, that when we think about technology, we actually should think about all the elements of um, technology operations and human interface and how they work together for the customer. So what we, the way we think about it is, we don't design a digital bank for digital savvy people. We design an inclusive bank that can be used for everyone. And technology is just one of the tools we use to increase accessibility. When it comes to designing um, appropriate products for customers, you know, we always say in our business that the mother of innovation uh, is not intelligence or creativity, it is compassion. And in this regard, I believe that our customers are our teachers. Um, so right from the start, engaging with customers, learning from customers is very important. But here is something that most banks will not tell you. And that is that you learn more about the shortcomings of your product and what customers really need after you've launched your product than you do before you launch your product. And therefore, the, the product logic that we now apply and the design logic that we apply is a logic of continuous redesign. To make this successful, of course, you don't only have to be good at listening to your customers and, and knowing which design tweaks and changes to make to your product. You actually have to be great at developing and changing your products at a fast pace. And I think this agile development uh, ability is at the heart of, over time, creating superior product. So um, uh, I'd go further to say that um, fast-paced product development is like a superpower in a business like ours. Because what it allows us to do at the moment, for instance, we do 40 code drops in production. These are changes in the production environment, environment every week. And what that allows us to do is to listen to our customers and tweak our products as we go. I would say that our product today is already a very different product, already a very a much better product from, for our customers than it was when we launched it uh, 18 months ago. So I think he speaks very eloquently to the much wider role that digital uh, technologies can play in the transformation of banking and, and cost alone. Um, uh, to close out the conversation on fully digital retail bank, uh, I wanted to come back to our inclusion lens um, and speak very briefly about how 
how this model can and expand access to financial services across all four. Again, I'll, I'll go through it fairly at a high level and we can dive into it more deeply if people are interested. So the first element clearly is cost. The lack of branches, the automation, the cloud native solutions, et cetera, create significant cost advantages, both to enter the space and to scale up over time. Uh, when it comes to access, uh, digital channels uh, clearly make services more available to people. The partnerships with, with retail partner uh, can create far larger footprints than traditional banks have. Scoring models, uh, innovative scoring models, expand eligibility and so forth, all of which brings banking closer to people, puts it within reach of, of more people. When it comes to product fit, uh, these tech stacks built on microservices and the, the product development practices that come along with it, which is what uh, Conrad was alluding to earlier, uh, results in financial services that are more tailored to people, more relevant for people. Uh, and that's what he was trying to convey so, so nicely. Um, and when it comes to the product experience, uh, they just create product uh, products and interfaces that are easier to understand, easier to use uh, effectively, uh, and uh, in short, creates a more customer-centric uh, experience of banking than uh, traditional banks tend to, tend to offer. So let me stop there. Uh, I don't see a lot of uh, open questions in the QA, so I'll hand over to you, Elizabeth, to see if there's been a discussion there or if there are anything, any questions that you want to pose. Sure. So one one question I I have is thinking about this broader MSME segment. Um, there's clearly a major difference when you think about a micro enterprise versus a medium scale enterprise, for example. What do you see in in your research uh, in terms of um, this particular digital retail bank model targeting? Do you see it's a little bit more geared toward a certain type of enterprise? Are there certain characteristics that make it a better fit? I would say that we have seen more uh, of these digital banks that are targeting the micro, really micro segment. Uh, there are even a bunch of them that target freelancers specifically that build themselves as, as serving freelancers. Uh, and some of them are looking at uh, businesses with one employee, two employees and, and so forth. So they, I would say typically are looking at really small, small businesses. Uh, not at all the sort of medium size, not, I, I don't want to say not at all, but uh, there is uh, there are far fewer of them that have a sort of clear profile towards uh, the the upper end of that uh, MSME scale, right? The medium sized uh, enterprises, where I suspect that they might have greater competition from the incumbent banks. I think maybe it's fair to say that some of the advantages that you get out of digital, um, th maybe they're not as compelling when you're dealing the bigger the enterprise customer that you're working with, right? because that enterprise customer is equally clunky and, and admin heavy and so forth, right? So, so maybe some of the, the flexibility and personalization and the speed and whatever that, that you get out of digital is more relevant the lower end that you go of, of, of individuals and businesses and maybe less relevant the higher up you go. Perfect. Okay, we do have a couple questions here. It looks like the first one is from Chris. He says, can you explain more about the channel partnerships what are the revenue relationships for channel partners and how are they managed? Do they lose some control over the customer experience? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, yes, in short, they, they do lose control of the customer experience. The partnerships, they, they, there are different approaches to the partnership, but um, uh, oftentimes they are scale-based, right? So it's based some some kind of revenue sharing or or service fee based on transaction volume. Uh, that, that would be the standard approach, I would say. Uh, the question about whether they lose control of the customer experience is a central one. I would argue that that is potentially the biggest, single biggest weakness in this model is that you, you hand over control um, uh, or degree of control over that end user experience so significantly to your partners that you really have to pick them well uh, you really have to have a strong partnership with them and, and help shape that. And that is most certainly the case for time uh, as well, right? They, they are really dependent on these partnerships with pick and pay and boxer, these big mass market uh, grocery stores, basically. Um, and uh, that expresses itself in, in different ways. If the people manning the tills uh, at those stores 
aren't trained, don't know what time bank is, aren't so used to doing the transactions, that's going to degrade the customer experience. It's even the case that time bank actually the transactions are uh, they're sort of baked into the user interface that the, the the standard pick and pay and boxer interface, right? Which is much, much less sophisticated than what time bank offers. And we went down there, uh, actually spent some time with them. And some of it's very counterintuitive and not that easy to use, but that's not time's fault. It's because that's the UI that the pick and pay or the boxer are using and it's just not great. Um, and, but there's not much that, that the time bank can do about that. The brand, the, that's where the, these um, kiosks become important as something that they can control. So they can have that in the store as well. And they have their ambassador there who can then help to, to take over if there are problems, help resolve it and bring people over to the kiosk and, and sort things out there. So I think they have picked quite a smart approach in, in that regard, but it's an excellent question and, and goes right to one of the core weaknesses here. So let's do just one more before we move on in the interest of, of time. Um, so Jimmy asks, are fully digital banks opening up new markets, signing new customers, or are these banks basically uh, banking all of the already banked? Do you see digital banks deepening inclusion or widening inclusion? I see Arisha is already typing an answer and she has spent a lot of time talking to a bunch of the banks in developing markets specifically. So she'll, she no doubt pull out some, some stats in her answer on that. Uh, the short answer I would give is we're seeing a little bit of both. Of course, it's the case that to some extent, you know, the people who are smartphone savvy and tech interested uh, are going to be early adopters of, of these things. But we are most definitely seeing uh, these banks also attract people who have been unbanked and underserved and poorly served uh, in the past. I think Time Bank is a great example of that, but there are others as well, such as uh, Kotak 811 in, in India, Union Bank in the Philippines, and we're gonna be talking about a couple of those uh, more, more later in, in the session. Uh, but short answer, a little bit of both, and, and hang in there for Arisha to, to provide some more of the details. Okay. All right. So I think in the interest of time, let's move on to the next model. And uh, thank you, Arisha, for continuing to uh, answer those questions as we go. Thank you. So the next model, let me make sure I can advance the slide. Uh, the next model is marketplace banking. Um, and they are an interesting blend of B2B and B2C that sort of embodies the spirit and the capabilities of the digital age. These players recognize that um, with increasing specialization and competition um, in out of the fintech sort of explosion, um, it's becoming harder and harder to be best in class for every product. Uh, and more importantly, they recognize that there's actually a business model in being a trusted broker in that increasingly complex universe. And that results in a quite a different take on retail banking and what it aims to do for clients. So at first glance, it looks pretty similar to traditional banking. The product set is, is fairly similar. The crucial difference here is that marketplace banks offer products uh, by other financial service providers as well, sometimes lots of them. And the central value proposition that they give to end customers is basically to be a one-stop shop for um, best-in-class products, regardless of whose those products are. They help customers to sort of navigate this increasingly complex space, uh, which involves finding those products, vetting those products, making sure they're good, that they're safe to use. It involves varying degrees of, of curation so that people aren't overwhelmed by everything that's out there. So they see the most relevant options. Um, and of course it involves sort of seamless integration, easy onboarding and, and all of that. So the value proposition tends to revolve uh, a lot around that finding curation and, and onboarding and creating a process of that. Um, but um, marketplace banks have another key difference as well. And that is that they have an entirely different set of customers, namely the product providers themselves. So they have a whole B2B side to these third party financial service providers. And to them, the bank offers, you know, a highly scalable, low cost customer acquisition channel. Um, and it can offer, also offer various kinds of data that, that the product players can use to, to refine their offering and personalize it. Um, and so marketplace banks tend to have quite a different revenue model with two distinct sides to it as well. So B2C, it looks very similar to, to traditional digital retail banks, but they're also generating revenue 
from the third party product providers. And that can be structured in different ways. Uh, the, the can be commissions, straight commissions on referrals. Sometimes there are fees per API call or other scalable, uh, scalable fees. Uh, they do product revenue share sometimes. The bank can, can uh, sort of offer subscription models um, and so forth. So it, it tends to be a bit, bit of a blend and different banks are, are taking different approaches to that. The core business logic is somewhat distinct, right? So this revolves all, all around deciding where you want to compete, uh, which, what is the value proposition, what is the product set that you want to offer and control, and then you focus hard on that and partner for everything else. And it involves shifting your, the relationship that you have with customers away from selling your stuff, which let's be honest, is what most banks and mobile money providers tend to do, um, towards being their advisor, their, their partner, helping to find the solutions that meet their problems and their needs best in a way that is uh, sort of suitable and, and, and fits with their preferences. And because they think that that's the best way to actually deepen your customer stickiness, even as competition at a product level is growing tenfold, right? So that un inherent logic, underlying logic is, is quite different uh, from both traditional banks and from uh, the standard retail banks. Um, again, I'll skip over the dependencies. Oh, this is a little clip from Tandem that I think exemplifies it really, really nicely, uh, the sort of the value proposition that some of these guys have, right? Uh, so in short, hey, your electricity bill has gone up a lot. Do you want to save money? Well, I have a suggestion for you to switch. You can save 35 pounds. Do you want to do it? Okay, let's do it. It's done, right? Beautiful, simple, works great for the customer. And for that, you don't even need to charge the customer anything because you're charging the B2B player, the product provider on the back end. So that is exemplifies the sort of uh, one aspect of the value proposition that these players uh, bring. Not every bank can, can offer this, of course, it depends on the FinTech environment, how many products are out there uh, on the IT stack and so forth. I think the, the main takeaway here is that marketplace banks have a very different business model for retail banking, right? They are not necessarily concerned at all with deposit mobilization or net interest margin, things that are central to most banks, right? They don't actually need to hold people's money at all if they don't want to. Everything can sit on the balance sheet of another financial service provider because the focus for them is almost entirely on the end customer relationship, on providing value through superior UX and superior curation of services. They wanna be the default entry point for everything that has to do with money. Uh, the same way that Amazon has become the default entry point for, for retail commerce in large parts uh, of the world. The, the one place you go when you have something you wanna do with money. And that is a radically different approach to, to what banking is. There's a wide spectrum of different approaches to this model. Um, uh, and um, I'm gonna try and exemplify. So on the one hand, uh, we have actually many of the challenger banks. Um, you may have heard of some of these banks, uh, but you may not have realized that they actually adopt what we consider to be marketplace model because they tend to be laser focused on building their own core value proposition and their own actual core tech stack. Um, and so they don't have time from the get-go to get into every single product category. And so partnering with third-party fintechs for, for products tends to be a great way to quickly expand your product offering. Because the main objective to, to these guys in the marketplace model is to expand that range. They tend to partner with one product partner per product category, right? That's the fastest way to do it. Bam, 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 bam. And you can see from the slide how that looks for some of the notable banks. Um, that's not just in developed markets. This is a Mexican bank, which is an offshoot from a Spanish one, but that is uh, employing uh, a similar model. And we have a few others that, that come to mind as well. But just to say it's earlier days, but this is happening in developing markets as well. And another uh, example from, from emerging markets is in the Philippines, it's Union Bank. Um, and I wanted to uh, let us listen to them a little bit to describe how they think about the marketplace model. Traditionally, a bank app would offer uh, only products that are built by the bank. Um, but we uh, espouse open banking, even though it's not yet fully here in the Philippines. We embrace this concept and are building products um, and, and experiences that are not just Union Bank branded, right? And I think the first 
Um, the first one here, the first example that I can talk about is our remittance feature, which we put into place in March this year because when the pandemic hit, we were hearing a lot of people uh, needing to transfer money to the provinces and not being able to access physical branches of these remittance companies because they were closed. And so we, we right away, we knew we had to partner and we worked with a couple of fintechs that were connected to these remittance companies. And so we enabled remittances from our app through these partnerships. So again, another example of just taking on a different mindset about access and, and how we can bring new products to our, to our clients by partnering. Um, and so we're also working on uh, insurance and different loans um, to be put on our, on our different platforms. And actually that leads me to another point, our subsidiary UBX already does have a platform uh, called CCAP that is offering loans to, to the underserved uh, markets. And these loans are, it's a marketplace for loans. So it's, we offer union bank loans, but we also offer and host other institutions loans um, because sometimes they're a better fit for the clients that we're trying to reach. Some banks are taking this model even further. Uh, Starling in the UK is one of the banks that's really doubling down on the marketplace model. And, and I thought it'd be good to see what they are offering. And this is specifically for MSME clients because they're one of the banks that has a dual offering. So you get a bit the sense of what they're offering there, which they think of as the app store for your finances. Um, over time, they are looking to onboard any FSP that qualifies. And as you can see, they're also adding in non-financial services to that offering, including tools specifically for MSMEs uh, around, for instance, accounting. There are other approaches to this. So some banks often, uh, some banks focus on a very narrow product category, but then go for volume on providers. Raisin, as an example, their deposit marketplace, uh, uh, but they don't offer any savings accounts of their own. Instead, they're partnering with banks. So they have 92 partner banks and uh, customers uh, can then uh, search and find the best interest rates across banks, across the entire European Union, which is where they operate. Um, and, uh, and so Raisin sits in the middle and brokers that between the partners and the clients. They mobilized 13 billion euros uh, uh, so far, which is pretty, pretty significant. So some marketplace banks plug in a single player per category. Uh, some of them uh, pick a specific product category and then uh, have loads of partners, product partners within that category. And then there are marketplace uh, players who do both and, and financial in China is a great example of that. It, offers the full range of financial products and services to their clients, but then within each product category, it aggregates hundreds of FSPs and thousands of, of products, which sort of illustrates the other extreme end of, of the marketplace uh, spectrum. Um, you can see that these are quite different, but they all share an underlying uh, logic. Going back to our inclusion framework, we think this model has a lot to, to offer for, for financial inclusion and financial access. Obviously, uh, focusing the bank's costs on where they want to specialize uh, helps to reduce the cost for them. It lowers the product partner's costs for customer acquisition, and it drives competition uh, between the product players, all of which reduces uh, uh, the end-to-end -end cost and puts downward pressure on, on pricing. When it comes to access, obviously it makes more products available to people, makes it easier for people to find relevant products, make it quick and easy to, to start using them which makes services more, more accessible. When it comes to fit, uh, if customers have a wider variety of products to choose from, chances are higher, they'll find something that fits. Smart personalization increases those chances um, and, and uh, they grow further with products that, that are customizable, all of which sort of empowers customers to, to find and adapt services to meet their needs. Um, and the uh, experience uh, finally, uh, is uh, sort of uh, uh, brings the convenience of, of a supermarket to financial services through this 
a one-stop shop kind of approach, making it as simple as possible for people to, to really find and just consume what it is they want to consume uh, without worrying too much about having to go find it themselves or onboarding in a very cumbersome way. Um, it is worth noting that uh, you know many or most of these advantages can be realized without being a bank. And, and the Asian super apps are a great example of that. There are fintechs who, who do the same thing within specific product bases. Um, and there are other players who are well-placed for it too. I would think mobile money players, for instance, uh, will, and other wallet players would be very well-placed to pursue this kind of uh, strategy. Uh, but let me take a pause there for a couple more questions before we move to the last model. Let's see, we have about 15 minutes left. So if anyone has um, a really pressing question about this model, please type away right now. Um, Otherwise, I would suggest maybe in the interest of time, we can go on to the next model and then catch any of the, the questions about this one and, and the next one at the very end. That sounds good. And this one um, is a little shorter, so uh, we should be able to get through uh, before the end. So banking as a service it is an entirely different model from everything we've talked about so far. These banks are best thought of as tech companies with a banking license. And what they offer is a combination of both. It is effectively white label banking products and capabilities, including the license, compliance, reporting, including the balance sheet and everything seamlessly integrated into the existing platform of the, the partner. Uh, of the customer and their customers all tend to be B2B players, often non-banks, fintechs, big digital brands, but sometimes other banks as well who wanna leverage on the tech capabilities that these players have. Um, and the value proposition is, is fairly straightforward. It lets those players offer banking services without the time, the cost, the hassle, the regulatory burden of actually having a banking license of their own. And hence these players um, tend to uh, substantially reduce the barriers to entry into banking. They often uh, help to bring down the cost of, of, of sort of a, a commodified set of plain vanilla products that they offer, but they also do, do provide bespoke, uh, highly customized products for those, those players, uh, customers who want that and are willing to pay a little bit more for it. The revenue model varies by product. It varies by customer. It tends to be some mix of, of volume-based fees monthly subscriptions and product level revenue share, including underwriting and, and funding of loans and, and the like. Um, the core business logic uh, is also quite different from the three, the two other models that we've looked at. It revolves a lot around creating economies of scope and scale uh, by, by commoditizing key building blocks in banking, right? And specializing on those back end capabilities while leaving the front end UI. Uh, entirely to their own clients. Uh, they just have the capacity to embed sort of seamlessly their financial building blocks into any digital consumer um, context. Um, one point I wanna make on, on the capabilities that you need aside from a license and sophisticated tech is very strong compliance and due diligence um, capabilities because these banks are on the hook for what their customers do. As far as regulators are concerned, the clients, the end customers, all belong to the banking as a service player, not to the front end brand, even though uh, the customers might, might, might look at it differently. Um, let's look at a couple of very quick examples. Well, maybe I'll, I'll skip quite quickly uh, through this in the interest of time, but just to say that Tide in the UK uh, was one of the first digital retail banks to really serve micro and small enterprises. They're one of the, the more successful ones they have about 5% market share now growing quickly, 10% of all new accounts, business accounts, bank accounts are, are tied open in the UK. They are not a bank at all, right? They are powered by Clear Bank. They just do the front end and they do it well. Um, Affirm uh, is one of the biggest fintechs here in the United States. They're an e-commerce lender. They offer a very competitive savings account as well. Um, and again, they are not a bank. The lending, the savings account, none of it is offered by, by Affirm it's all on the balance sheet of Cross River. Um, but this is not just about powering fintechs. The BAS model is, is really much more transformative than that. Um, and a very short clip from Solaris Bank will give you the idea of why. These days, everything we do is becoming more seamless. 
From how we communicate to the way we shop for groceries, people want digital and hassle-free experiences in every aspect of their lives, and it's up to businesses to meet that need. So, what does that mean for financial services? Consumers aren't necessarily looking for a new bank, but they have a variety of needs and wishes which often involve financial services. For example, when buying a new home or car, or paying for goods when shopping online. In order to provide seamless experiences, more and more companies link financial services, like loans or payments, directly to their products. That way, consumers can get exactly what they need without the hassle of additional clicks or having to visit a bank. For companies looking to connect their products with financial services, there are two options. One, get your own banking license. Or two, connect with a licensed banking partner. If you decide for option two, your company needs a fast, technologically advanced, and regulatory sound partner for a smooth and hassle-free process. That's why we built Solaris Bank. Solaris Bank offers an easy connection for any company to a marketplace of financial services, our banking platform. On our platform, companies can choose what financial products they want to offer their own customers. We make it simple for digital companies, fintechs, corporates, and banks to integrate financial services into their existing products and websites. By enabling businesses to bring bank accounts and debit cards or lending and payment services directly to their customers, we reshape how financial services are received and used in our daily lives. So, would your company like to bring banking closer to your customers? Then work with us. We've got a banking license, so you don't have to. Working on our platform is all about speed and simple processes, and this massively reduces the time needed to bring your financial product to your customers. Offer your own seamless financial products with Solaris Bank. This book really shows what, what re revolutionary potential um, there is in BAS for completely upending uh, where people get financial services and what it means to be a bank. Basically, any company who has customers and has some use case for financial services can offer it thanks to banking as a service. Um, and we're already seeing this at play in, in the developed markets in particular, right? So Apple, Walmart, and Uber are three of the biggest companies in the world, right? Um, they have absolutely massive customer bases and today they all offer bank accounts and various kinds of, of banking services. So did they all get a banking license? No, of course not. There are banking as a service providers sitting in the back end that are doing all of that. And as far as regulators go, those clients all belong to Green Dot and Goldman Sachs in this case, right? But that's not how customers see it at all. The customers have never heard of these banks, of course, um, which, uh, which sort of exemplifies both the power and some of the risk, arguably, um, in the BOSS model. So we see a number of advantages here, uh, uh, cost being uh, uh, an important one, of course, because of the specialization, the commodification um, uh, of financial services that helps to build those cost efficiencies. Access, of course, is a, is a huge one um, because it, it expands the range of who can provide financial services to basically anyone um, and lets financial services be embedded in non-financial contexts, all of which means that financial services can meet, uh, uh, meet customers where they are. Banking is no longer this thing over here on the side, but it's something that presents itself organically uh, when, when you need it. Um, when it comes to product fit, uh, the, the sort of seamless integration uh, into an existing uh, flow, into an existing business of the, of the client, the B2B client is inherent in this, and, and the, which means that the, the financial services are sort of better aligned to real world needs across a number of different contexts because the, the financial products are not picked at random. They're picked to fit neatly into the core business of the business, um, uh, the company that wants to offer. Um, and when it comes to experience, again, this is all, the, the whole premise is for it to be seamless and simple. And, and so it tends to really, you know, make uh, financial services easier uh, to, to access, uh, easier to, to use because of this embedding. Let me stop there and see what the time, we have five more minutes. So maybe one um, as we're as we're wrapping up here, uh, if people do not have very specific questions about about the models at this point, I 
I'm very curious about where everything is is heading uh, going forward, in particular, where you see these different models um, evolving and and what it might look like, especially as more developing um, and emerging markets begin to uh, uh, really uh, leverage a lot of the new technologies. Sorry, Elizabeth, I was multitasking. You're reading your question coming oh, in the okay, Q&A yes. from Nikki. What were you saying? <laughs> One more time. No, so we actually, um, I was going to just, uh, let's hold that mind for a second. Let's have Nikki's uh, question. Looks like a good one. So she's I think asked, a good question. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, he's asking about the scale needed to make these models viable. So the short answer is no, uh, we, we don't have a clear clear view on it. I think the, the, the part of the short answer as well is that most of them do need scale. Right, they are all built on as low margin, high scale businesses that they have in common. Um, and, and the whole sort of setup, the operational setup is geared around that too. Um, so, so that would be the short answer. Uh, we don't know what the sort of scale requirement is, but expect it to be high. Okay, great. Okay, let's see. Probably have time for yeah. maybe just one more. So, if you see this list, anyone jumps out at you? Yeah, I, just quickly, uh, are there examples of, of digital retail banks and marketplace banks combined? I think yes. I mean, I think some of the examples, N26, Revolut, uh, Starling, you might think of those as fully digital retail banks. You might not consider them marketplace banks. They, they are that by our definition. Um, I definitely think there is a lot of um, interflow there. Uh, I think some players are starting in one end maybe they plug in third-party products in the beginning, but over time they want to integrate those into their own offering. Uh, so it's just done as a matter of expediency. Uh, I think we're seeing others go in the other direction. They have the ambition to build the full thing, realize that it's hard and then go, you know what? We don't need to, we can, we can add on things. So I think it's a very fluid space and I think we're going to see players moving across and, and doing various versions of these models. And it's worth noting that, you know, uh, there are players that operate across all of these. So Starling Bank also offers banking as a service, for instance, right? So uh, the point I'm making is these are three distinct business models, but that doesn't mean that they have to be three different businesses, uh, right? That any one business can draw on elements of each. It's harder to do because you need to meet all the sort of requirements to make each model work, but you, you absolutely can. So I think these are sort of, we've stylized these business models, which I think is helpful in understanding the space and trying to build these businesses. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of mix and matching going on. There's players starting in one place, pivoting it into another space. And we're gonna see that, that continue. Um, when it comes to feature phones, uh, the short answer is no. Most of them do require uh, smartphones, which is a constraint. Uh, that said, for some of it, you only need smartphones for the occasional um, uh, interaction, right? So if what you're, do most of your transactions are with a debit card, all you need is to have a smartphone uh, and to occasionally use data, but you don't necessarily need to be a, a sort of a high power user. But we're not seeing this being deployed on, on feature phones, uh, certainly as, as yet. Okay. Opportunities for innovation. I, let me take the last one as well. The nexus of mobile and banking. What's the opportunity for innovation? To me, the opportunity is clear. Mobile money providers have created the accounts. The accounts are not yet useful for people because they don't have, they only have access to a limited set of services. The mobile money players should all go hard at marketplace banking model. That's my personal view. If they do, they will be very successful and, the, and clients will be very well served uh, by it. All right, perfect. I think we're just about out of time and you actually answered my question uh, about sort of what's next and what you're seeing in, uh, in addressing some of the other other questions. So, so thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah for some closing words. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, Peter, um, and Arisha for your hard work in the background there. Um, I've really enjoyed the session. I think, you know, so many of those those banks that you spoke about, you know, I've heard of Starling, I've heard of Time, obviously living in both South Africa and UK, those were models I was familiar with, but actually beginning to unpick it and understand what makes them successful, how they work, how you can offer such a broad range of things, how you can offer better value and cheaper services to your customer. It was really interesting, Peter, that you took us through that night. I feel like 
digital banking was something that I used a lot as a term, but actually now I really understand it a lot more having gone through those models in, um, in, in more detail with you. And I also have a much bigger grasp of actually how important it is for financial inclusion, you know, sort of almost turning it on its head. So it's actually it's about bringing things that customers want and need, not what we think people should be doing, which is I think typically of what some of the, you know, incumbent banks and MNOs sort of currently do. So, you know, for me, I'm very excited. I'm going to go and Google Starling Bank, seeing as now I'm in the UK and can open an account, see what maybe they can offer me, um, but also just an experiment. I mean, that's how we learn, right? I mean, you know, I haven't, I haven't ever been involved. My bank is an incredibly big incumbent bank here in the UK and also back in South Africa. So I think it's time for us all to experiment and see how it goes and to learn. And definitely think if we've got M any MNOs on the call, then you should take up Peter's advice <laughs> um, and, and move towards that, that marketplace model. Um, I really enjoyed the session. Thank you so much, Peter, Elizabeth and Arisha. Thank, Thank you. you all our attendees for staying on the line. Um, this was our last webinar for the year, but what a really informative one to end on it. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you again on a webinar in 2021. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. And just to say, um, we'll be continuing the conversation. I hope we could have more time for conversation. That's always the case. But let's keep it going. Please feel, me, feel free to email me. We'll be sending out the deck so you can read it at your own time. We have a lot more content, so please go to cgap.org slash fintech, where you can find uh, decks, blogs, various kinds of materials, several uh, webinars on related topics as well. So if you want more, I'll feel free to dig in there and, and feel free to, to be in touch with me on, on email, LinkedIn, Twitter, platform of choice. Perfect, and we'll send some of those links out with the recording as well, so people can find them easily. Bye. Excellent. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.